Uh, the idea is that this Neko shade would be visually concealed behind the light shelf from the user. Uh, we could have dynamic shading below and permanent uh, clear story above to reflect light deeper into the space. Uh, and then just a quick look at the parametric model that we put together with Grasshopper, uh, being able to control things like the profile curve, the rotation, uh, the height above the floor, the depth from the glazing. Uh, you get the idea, but we just wanted to test a range of possibilities here. And rather than doing a whole UDI study, we're just looking at basic solar ray tracing at different times of the year. Um, but all of these quick studies, it's important for us to remind ourselves uh, this quote, which we like a lot. Uh, essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And especially when we're doing these digital simulations, and we are just designers. We don't consider ourselves daylighting experts. Uh, we try to encourage a comparative strategy for our simulations rather than prescriptive. Uh, these are not the end results. So this is important for us on digital simulation uh, as well as, as, well as uh, physical mock-ups. And definitely the case here because this is our really shoddy uh, light shelf mock-up that we put together um, really quickly in pretty much one afternoon. Uh, we just recycled some plywood and then had some fun with some electronic devices. Uh, testing out digital overrides and dropping in a photo sensor in the bottom, hooking up a stepper motor, and then putting a recycled sheet of bond paper here. So this, is, this isn't this is very rigorous uh, simulation of the actual thing. Um, but what this led us to in our kind of crazy workflow is we modeled these gears really quickly. Uh, they were loud, they would skip, they weren't very accurate. Uh, we had all the other things figured out, but that kind of became a pain. Um, and then we kind of figured for future mock-ups, let's just get this right. Let's study how gears are made for machinery. Uh, this is the awesome part about Grasshopper. So we really just uh, did a little bit of research. Uh, turns out the shape of these teeth are really important for the gear's performance. Uh, they're modeled with an involute curve. So the intention here is to just model a series of tangent circles and then create your gears automatically from that, uh, whether they be mitered or spurred. Uh, these can then be set up for 3D printing, milling, or laser cutting. Um, so pretty much the idea here is that we can quickly make physical mock-ups in the future. Uh, also, as designers start to think about kinetic installations, uh, flexible jigs, and malleable molds. Um, so if we, if we take a step back for a minute and think about that whole process, we started off with a basic light shelf idea, <laughs> and then we ended up with a gear generator. So that's kind of all over the place sometimes. And you can liken this to a conversation with a friend where uh, what you're talking about now is way off the original topic. And that's the kind of conversation we like to encourage uh, at times in the office and can often lead to uh, new discoveries. Uh, but to get a little more practical here, let, let's focus on parametric modeling and simulation. Um, and again, you've heard this today already, but it's really important for us to use environmental simulation uh, as early in the design process as possible. Um, just last week, we presented at the Revit Technology Conference on a basic plugin that will reference an Excel spreadsheet uh, and create 3D masses in Revit and Grasshopper. And then from there, we can sort that data based on the Excel spreadsheet. Uh, the same way you would sort in Excel, you can sort that in our 3D modeling environment. Uh, but when it comes to modeling explicitly, uh, as serving as kind of a critique of the existing standards, uh, the OSNAP is accurate, uh, as you know, but you can snap to the wrong thing. It can be a little cumbersome, and it's not really nice for putting basic masses together quickly. Uh, the gumball is just the opposite. It's really fast, it's fluid, uh, except it's not accurate. You have to uh, hotkey into the OSNAP, and then you run into the same issues. So this is just a basic definition uh, using a Python script uh, that just has a basic Rhino script syntax. Uh, what this definition is doing is it's listening to the selected geometry in Rhino. And when you select that geometry and move it, uh, it will find the closest point or closest edge of adjacent geometries. So the idea is to kind of merge uh, the fluid user-friendly feel of the gumball and maintain the accuracy of the OSNAP. Uh, so from there, we can we can get the the accuracy of a massing model uh, modeled quickly and on the fly, and then using that same listener to your selected object, you could select some of that geometry, uh, apply target transparency for for the cardinal directions of the facade, um, 
and from there, since we we have this kind of block snapping uh, routine, we have a nice shoebox and eggshell model. Uh, the surrounding geometries are declared as shades, uh, and then of course adjacent faces are made adiabatic, and then the other materials are applied. So it's kind of the same process as the modeling method, except now we're selecting this geometry and running a quick light burst simulation. Uh, and this is just kind of a proof of concept, but what we're trying to say is uh, the distance between conceptualization and modeling, uh, that gap should be narrowed. Uh, and from there, because of these tools available us, to us, uh, we can narrow the gap between modeling and simulation. So within a matter of minutes, you could run through uh, an, an entire process, uh, get your thermal model from that, and then export your values again, uh, these heating, electric, and cooling loads. Uh, you could export that to a spreadsheet and then test out various schemes. Uh, and then outside of that kind of basic workflow from those really primitive simulations, uh, as we move further into projects, uh, we, we like to work closely with our consultants, uh, determine uh, what type of metrics they need for their studies. Uh, they obviously have a lot more expertise than we do. Um, so creating this kind of same attitude for generating uh, our fenestration patterns um, or, or other zone values that they would need on the fly. Uh, so just to give some context to that, this is our 34 stone project uh, in Seattle, which has high aspirations for sustainability. Uh, it's targeting living building challenge as well as uh, LEED Platinum certification. So on top of that, those are all some kind of basic metrics that we've looked at before. Uh, what interests us as well is looking at new metrics, uh, kind of choosing on a case-by-case -case basic basis when to apply the right diagram to the right problem. Uh, and the sun position battery uh, from Diva is just great. Uh, it's been really helpful for uh, shading studies and early process. Uh, so we first use it to create solar paths, and then we, from there uh, we were interested in creating basic shadow diagrams. Uh, we could test this point whether it's in the shade at a specific time. And then after that, we could create an overshadowing diagram all within Grasshopper. Uh, of course, this is just this, these shadows are the uh, spherical projection of this context onto the solar dome. Uh, and you can see that this point is in the shade because of the direct shadows cast, uh, whereas this point is in the shade because the sun is contained in an overshadowed area. Uh, so trying to figure out how to improve on that, the overshadowing diagram is great, but it's not very intuitive and it's really confusing. Uh, it's, it's difficult to explain to others. Um, so we were thinking, what if we just projected these solar paths onto the overshadowed areas and then unrolled them? Again, this is all within Grasshopper, so uh, we keep that automation going. And this way we can test this point at a whole bunch of different points on the site. And here, since we have the actual length of these curves, we can quantify them uh, as a percentage of a day uh, or look at different times of the year and test whether those are in the shade or sunlight. So. Ideally, it becomes a more legible bar graph versus the original overshadow graph, uh, and you're also able to get some quantities from it, uh, at least as percentage values. Um, so what we have here is, you can see in the top, uh, we have two identical overshadowed diagrams, uh, but at different latitudes. Seattle versus Cape Town, South Africa, we get significantly uh, different results. And of course, we like to share this uh, with the public, uh, share as much of our work with the public as we can. Um, so this is kind of a blog post. We're kind of putting this in our back pocket for now, but we have applied it to uh, certain stages of the projects. This is a basic uh, overhang study, seeing how far an overhang needs to pop out uh, to reach a target shading uh, with that metric. Uh, uh, throughout the year. Uh, but to step back to practice, that's kind of more on the research side. Um, let's take a look at this project. This is something that we're pretty excited about in the office. It's a 500 uh, foot tall uh, hotel tower in downtown Seattle. Uh, it's also going to be a convention center as well as uh, serving for low income housing. So there's a lot of complexity going on in the project. And it's also going to have a pretty significant effect on the Seattle skyline. So it's something that we're working hard on right now. Um, and in early studies, we were looking at different tower massing options, uh, pretty much a north versus south tower alignment. And it was important for us to study the effect that that shading would have on the existing streetscape. 
Uh, so how many ways to study a shadow? We, we went through a whole bunch. Uh, early on, we wanted to keep, we knew we wanted to keep something legible and intuitive here. So the first application was creating uh, the overshadowing diagram and this Rorschach shadow diagram uh, to create our percentages based on perimeter points on our site just to see what the existing context was doing. Uh, and while the, while the kind of legibility, it, it's intended to be more intuitive, it's really abstract. Uh, so when we moved to a shadow range study, uh, which can be helpful at times, it wasn't really showing us much here, uh, except that we're not getting much shade in December and we're getting significantly more in June. Uh, so, and just to give you some context here, this, these were diagrams that we had to present not only to the client but also to the public. Uh, as, we were, as we were getting approval, we're working with the developer on this one. Uh, it was important to get past the early design guidance, and we had a lot of the public coming in and asking questions like these. Uh, so our diagrams needed to be legible, um, and this study I don't think is the best contender for it, but what we were looking for was uh, considering the shading of our tower uh, onto the existing pedestrian streetscape and how that compares to the context around it. Uh, so we tested these comparing our two different facades and taking off percentages based on uh, the radius around, and then kind of dumbing that down even more, uh, we just took uh, basic shadows at different times during the day uh, next significant parts of the year and comparing their areas. Uh, the South Tower was our preferred option for other reasons, but here we're really just proving that this is preferred because it's shading the streetscape less. Uh, it's obviously shading its own pavilion throughout the year. So this is kind of a far cry from our more robust shadow studies. Uh, but it was really important for us to just make them as clear as possible and show that we were quantifying our data on some level uh, rather than just making a statement. And here are the final values. Uh, just last week we passed the EDG, which was not an easy process, so I'm uh, pretty happy about that. But within this, within this, uh, this project here, we can look at alternative sh solar studies uh, outside of the context of this kind of polished design that we have to present to the public. And uh, earlier we were looking at two uh, towers for this design. Um, a great thing again about having Diva and Grasshopper is how you can customize your grids, uh, tie that into another visualization software and see what your results are. So here we're just selecting uh, pretty much a cell uh, represents a hotel room and we're taking an analysis grid from that, doing some irradiation tests and comparing values for different schemes. Uh, we can also consider different schemes. Here are some view studies uh, where in each hotel room we're shooting out an ISOVIS diagram and seeing uh, how far you can see without hitting an object. Uh, and then comparing these, these different schemes, we can set up these different gradients where we have solar on the left, view on the right, and use this to, to drive our facade designs. Uh, so those are the two most important metrics we're looking at. And then kind of trying to simplify that into a more elegant form early in the process. Uh, this might be a little confusing, but what this is is a diagram uh, with text dots on each exterior surface. The text dots uh, represent target transparency values. Uh, then with our definition, we're calling it a transparency tool. Uh, we take the areas of those surfaces, uh, sum them together, and see what our total glazing is. Uh, we're also isolating parts that are prevented from energy code for these values. And our target value is 40% as dictated by Seattle Energy Code. And this is kind of a nice quick way for us to study those schemes. Uh, we're also working with Arab as the mechanical engineers on these projects. Um, so we're able to share this definition with them and they export these values directly to their uh, design model. Uh, this is, we're just getting started with this, but it's going pretty well so far. So lastly, well, let's step back a bit and talk about working within a wider range of design options, which we've seen today with some optimization ideas. Uh, we also want to test that just for basic design ideas. Uh, so the most important thing for us is to collect a wide range of data uh, based on our constraints. And when you're working in parametric modeling, these constraints are your friend. Uh, we try to narrow down the gaps as much as we can uh, so we can whittle down to our target design. Uh, but the first step here is to search, to run your kind of batch uh, simulation or rendering, uh, see what all of your values are, and then after that we want to synthesize all of, its, all of these values. Sometimes we can have thousands of iterations of these tests, 
Uh, we want to condense them into a legible interface and be able to navigate through this database we've created. Uh, and lastly, is to refine. Uh, and this is the important part for the designer. Uh, this is where his responsibility comes in to figure out uh, the best performing option as well as the most, uh, the most in agreement with design intent. So with those three in mind, this is kind of how we go about a process a good deal of the time. Uh, let's look at some matrix studies here. And just to give you some context, uh, this is the University of Iowa School of Music student commons here. Uh, we have a large clear story and a large southern overhang on a gigantic southern facade. Uh, we wanted to look at some luminance studies in this space uh, before we handed it off to the thermal modelers. Uh, so if you look at that southern overhang, we have a, a range here as well as our raised roof plane, which is our clear story height. We're creating a ba basic axis for each one and then running really crude uh, luminance studies uh, early on to see just what it looks like at a certain time. Uh, from there, we can whittle down into a smaller range to study. And then as we move further in the process, we can up the resolutions of these simulations and you know, spend more time uh, taking a look at them. So creating a false color out of this, uh, we can then start to take notes on that false color, uh, choose a scheme to look at even more closely, and then we start to piece apart different times and different viewpoints within this. Um, so this is really rough in the beginning, but towards the end, we, we really try to pick apart what our false colors are telling us. Uh, these notes are then sent off to our daylighting consultant, which in this case was HLB. And this kind of improves our rapport with them. Uh, we also earn their respect and really try to start speaking the same language, uh, which would help reduce turnover time and also kind of improve our design in the long run. So lastly, let's just look at reading from a database. Uh, this is some work we've done with the Advanced Computational Modeling Group uh, right here at Thornton Tom City. And it doesn't look like, there we go. Um, so the idea is to improve the workflow between architects and engineers. And the, the idea is we would send a few, a few models here uh, to Thornton Tomasetti through a SQL database. Uh, the engineer could then calculate uh, carbon loads, uh, uh, structural tonnage, beam sizes, column sizes, cost, carbon cost, uh, and then that could be imported back to us uh, through the SQL database. Uh, from there, we can import that into our model, test it for design intent, uh, also run a few basic DIVA studies. I think here we were doing uh, summer extreme day, winter extreme day, and a basic illumination grid. Uh, and also through this batch simulation, we can, we can run a, a wide range here and get these results pretty quickly. So what we end up is this, this whole mess of simulations and screenshots and databases. Uh, this isn't something that you want to navigate through as a designer or really anyone. Uh, so the important part is to condense that back into a legible interface. Uh, so we're using processing here, uh, where all those files are named a certain thing in accordance uh, with the iteration that they're run. And we're trying to, this is still a work in progress, but the important thing for us is to consider uh, navigating through all of these parameters, comparing their metrics, uh, considering fitness values in the case of optimization, uh, and also viewing it on a visual level. Because the designer, uh, the, there's not always an optimized value when it comes to architecture. Um, and we need to look at performance in addition to the visual aspects. So the intention here is to keep this interface generic. Uh, and whether you need a kind of basic rendering from your interior view, uh, or just look at performance based on your space. Uh, this is the kind of thing we've been working on, uh, and we're pretty excited about using large amounts of data to really not only drive but inspire uh, new designs. So if you're interested, uh, we put up a lot of our work on our blog here, um, and I think that's about it. Uh, thanks for listening, and if you have any questions, that's it. Uh, so it's been listed in the dreaded alternative category for the renovation. Uh, I'm really pushing for dynamic shading, uh, just you know, all the way down the window. Uh, but the important thing is we're bumping. If you saw in that slide, you're sitting right at the window. So 
when the when the shade when the light comes in, you have to reach way over your desk and pull the blinds down, and then you don't bother to do it the next morning, so the light doesn't come in. So the rearranging the furniture, I think, will help, and ideally, we'll get dynamic shading. But um, we're going to see. See, I do black and dynamic light for the light show. Right, yeah, and we have heard that from a good deal of people that's not really applicable uh, in that climate. Yeah. Any other questions? I have a question, actually. Um, so I'm interested about the, the part where you're talking about sharing the model with the top study and, and uh -huh. the SQL database. Um, because I see that it's happening more and more where they need to sort of share not just results, but We've had a couple situations at land where it's either an issue of actually sharing the model, so something that we send back and forth and it's added to, or you know, in this case with the grasshopper model, um, and then other you know situations where it's more um, of sharing you know the, the output file. So do you see kind of it's do you, how do you, have you had other examples where there's really um, a sort of more intimate sharing of, of data between uh, your firm and other firms? And if so, like, what's the nature of, of that relationship? Yeah, the only time we can really make a good case for sharing our model is when a consultant reaches a certain limitation uh, from their modeling software. Uh, and that's happened on an acoustic ceiling reflector. Uh, that Scott, the guy wearing the sunglasses, uh, has been working on. Um, he's, he's created a doubly curved surface within an auditorium, and our acoustical engineer uh, only works two-dimensionally for acoustical ray tracing. So an example we have there is that he would conduct the acoustical ray tracing and feed off those values uh, to the consultant. And that's, that's kind of important. Uh, we also think about when we have complex geometries, and we're putting out models for bidding. We'll try to get them into the appropriate software, like maybe Katia. And so our fabricators uh, won't completely overbid the project. They'll be able to look at it uh, from their native software. But the important part is not to have liability with those models as well. Uh, they're not being submitted for construction. Uh, but it's earlier kind of in design, development, and CDs that we really try to exchange uh, that data. Yeah. 